All right, we are now recording, and this is the uh, customer relationship management class. And what we're going to do is have a little review of some things coming up to the uh, midterm exam. And uh, if there are questions, those can be addressed. Actually, if you have questions, this is going to be recorded. So some of you may be watching this asynchronously or in independent processing, you know, meaning at a different time and a different place, decoupled. And so uh, if you are watching it in a decoupled manner, if you have questions, you can email them to yours truly, Professor Sampson, and I can respond to your questions, or you can, you know, go on to, you can email through regular email, which is on the syllabus here. Uh, you also, as you know, you all have my cell phone number right there. Look at that. This is on the front page of the syllabus, 722-9222. So you can always call me as well if you haven't, like, heartburn about some particular topic or whatever it is like that. Or there's the email address for the class, Samson class. Uh, and this is my office number, but I don't think that works anymore. They've kind of cut us off from uh, phone service at BYU. They don't actually provide phones anymore, which is kind of weird. Anyway, so I would hope uh, the uh, midterm exam is something people are kind of excited about. It's a chance to demonstrate things that we know. Uh, I don't know what you've heard about my uh, midterm exams or my exams, uh, but they're non-trivial, but they're certainly doable. Uh, every semester, there are students that ace this exam, just blow it out of the water, you know? And there are also students that struggle with it. And so hopefully we can get more in the ace category. Uh, so today in this review, which I plan to post on YouTube, assuming I can get copyright permission. Hey, wait a second, it's me. I guess I can get copyright permission. Will you give copyright permission? Sure, I'll give copyright permission. Okay, good, we'll post this on YouTube. Okay, great. All right, so if we, uh, um, what was I talking about? Oh, so this is, I'm not covering anything new today, meaning I encourage you to watch this video or I encourage you to, um, you know, come to these review sessions as we have them, but we're not really covering anything new. We're just basically going to give you some pointers about how you can prep for the exam. So this is the uh, syllabus here, and I'm going to scroll down here a little bit. So in the course syllabus, this is for 2023, which I'll probably show this in the future, uh, it talks about additional course reading. So we have two things that we've studied. We've studied the Essentials of Service Design and Innovation book, and the additional course readings, which are the articles, which are in Appendix B. And of course, unless you've had an appendectomy to your syllabus, in which case you don't have Appendix B, but sometimes people have like a partial appendectomy. So you might have Appendix A and not B or whatever. But anyway, um, so we have a midterm exam counts for, oh, this is it counts for hundred points. So actually the way I calculated it counts for 200 points, but we'll divide it by two. So it'll work out. Uh, let's see, preparation, participation, where is there something here about the midterm exam? Surely there's something here about the midterm exam. Ah, here we go. Two exams will be individual effort, not a team project, sorry, and require demonstrating and understanding application of course principles and techniques. The midterm exam will be in class and we'll cover material from chapters one through five. Actually, to be honest, I've told you otherwise that we have skipped chapter one. We just didn't have time for it. So I would not worry about chapter one. So it's really two through five. And the article is covered up to this point, which we will cover momentarily. The final exam, and then stuff about that. We don't need that now. We'll talk about that later. Okay. So here we go. So we didn't do chapter one. We did chapter two, and for 2023, I actually adjusted this a little bit. It's all the same, but I changed the order just a little bit because of some peculiarities we had this semester. So you have chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five. Uh, chapter six is about conducting a service process audit. There was really no new material there. That was just kind of instructions. So chapter six is really not on the midterm exam. So it's really two, three, four, and five are the ones that are on the midterm exam. Then we have uh, five, uh, let's see, five articles, Reichel and Sasser, Vander Merwer and Rada, Dasso and Chase, Fry, and Norman and Ramirez. So those are the five articles we've covered. 
And then we had Monday instruction. And then now today we are discussing the midterm exam. And then the midterm exam uh, will actually be next Tuesday in class. All right, any questions so far? All right, so let me talk about the article. So Appendix B, which was referred to previously, I keep scrolling down. Uh, presentation evaluation criteria, we'll talk about that later in a couple of weeks. Appendix B, study questions for the articles. Now, actually, before we talk about the articles, let me talk about the chapters. So there's the four chapters there. And sometimes students ask me, they say, is there a summary of the chapters, like a study guide or something like that? And the answer is, which I actually put in that little fact. Did you get the fact thing? Did anybody see the fact thing that I sent out? Okay. So people in the future, there's a fact document. If you haven't got the link to that, ask for that. So some questions about this. But the question is, is there a study guide? Well, for the chapters of the book, are the chapters concise or lengthy? By the way, this is not rhetorical. Anyone? I know. No class participation counts. Concise, concise. 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 Oh, thank you. So they are concise. So they are their own study guide. I, I have a copy of my book right here. Here. So if I look at the chapters and how long the chapters are, just study the chapters and any notes you've written in the margins or things that you've marked. You know, that's the best way to study the book is just to review the chapters. Now, I actually thought about this. So in 2023, for those of you living in the future, we have this thing called chat GPT. All right. So it's kind of weird. Now in the future, you'll say, ah, I remember chat GTP three, uh, chat GTP. That was horrible. Today we have chat, chat GPT 99 or whatever, you know, something better, but uh, it's actually pretty cool. So in chat GDP, I actually, and actually, I hate to say this, I had already written the exam. I worked on it last week. And so the exam was already written, but just yesterday I tried asking chat GDP to make up exam questions. Holy cow, it made some great exam questions. None of them are included this semester uh, on the exam because I don't trust it quite yet. But in the future, what we'll do is we'll take the book, we will shove it into chat GDP 97 and say, write an exam on this. And then I'll write an exam. And then I'll say, I'll look at the exam and I'll say, it's too hard. Write an easier exam. And I'll write a new exam that's easier. I'll say, no, that's too easy. And I'll write one that's harder. So anyway, that's the future here. So this is kind of a historical record here where we are today. Okay, any questions about the book? So if you have any questions specifically, about things like, for example, what is surrogate interaction? Okay, if you just cannot figure out the surrogate interaction thing, let me know. Raise your hand now if you're here in class now, or if you're in the future, then email me about this and say, what is surrogate interaction? But you need to know what that is. You know, there's a lot of things we've covered here. Uh, chapter two, we talked about things like bidirectional supply chains and, and what a service is. You know, it was two. Chapter three. What are we talking about? In fact, let me just scroll up here so you have something cool to look at. Scroll, 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 scroll. So chapter two, understanding services. Okay, we talked about customer inputs. Ah, oh, co-production. Yeah, important topic from chapter two and so forth. Chapter three, how to make a diagram. Okay, the shapes of the diagram, the, uh, the what else do we have in the diagrams? Uh, the regions that we have in the diagrams, the process domains that we have. Uh, yeah, chapter four, value, value potential, value realization, you know, what is value, how it relates to needs and subjective well-being and such like that. Hold on just a second. Somebody's here in my studio here. I need to close the door. All right, fixed. All right, so that was three. Uh, chapter, so that was four. So chapter five, strategic process positioning. Things like, you know, remember those operating characteristics of, you know, different regions, things like efficiency or what else do we do in that? We had like economies of scale, which is like expertise is a good example of that, economy of scale. 
and customization potential and things like that. So uh, chapter five is about enabling or leaving innovations. Those are some major points of that chapter five. Uh, you'll notice even as you go through your class notes, you know, I, we didn't cover really a lot new in class. We just kind of reiterated and kind of deepened our understanding of the principles there. Uh, but class notes are not everything. You still need to read the chapter. So if you say, ah, I went to class, I don't need to read the chapters. No, because there could be things in the chapters that are major points that we didn't cover in class just for the sake of time. So anyway, pretty straightforward with the chapters. I think it should be okay. So let's focus now more on the articles. And then at the end, I will just talk about the exam in general. All right, hold on just one second here. Uh, okay. A little screen here. Uh, okay. So the first article we covered this semester was Reichelt and Sasser's Zero Defections. Doesn't that seem like it was forever ago? Now, you people in the future, maybe you're watching this video because you're out surfing YouTube and you came across something, a video that was titled uh, Samson CRM class, I, things to think about in preparing for the midterm exam. And if you're watching this, bless you. I hope it doesn't scare you off here. But... Uh, with the articles I have emphasized previously, and will do so again, is that it's always best to read the articles before class, which you got to do anyway, because we have quizzes on article days. Uh, people in the future, if you haven't learned that already, yeah, we have quizzes on article days. Um, and uh, also in class, we talk about things and kind of emphasize and clarify some things. And then after class, you should have some little things you jotted down in class. You say, oh yeah, this is an important thing. Oh, I understand this. Then you can review that as well. And that's really the best way to study is to you know, prepare yourself before class, come to class, and then after class to review your notes. If you happen to miss class because you're at a, you know, a, uh, at a uh, Rubik's Cube competition uh, or something like that, then you can talk to classmates and find out what they did. You still read the article, and then you can review what their notes are. Okay, so what kind of factors are included in the lifetime value of a customer? So let's talk about this Reichelt one. So I have the articles called up here. Actually, I don't know why, I usually do this uh, review thing in class in person, and it just dawned on me, this is much more effective this way because I'm sharing my screen and I can show you all the articles instead of just hold them up in my hand here. So what are some factors that, so, uh, what I hope you would have done is look at these questions before you even read the articles, because it can kind of get you thinking about things. So factors included in the lifetime value of customers. Huh. Okay, so here, uh, defecting customers, zero defections. Okay, there's lots of great examples in these articles that they take us through. The cost of losing a customer. <gasps> okay, it's a factor in the lifetime value is acquiring customers. If you lose a customer, having to acquire customers. Okay, customers who defect to the competition can tell you what parts they improve. That's a different part of this article here. Uh, actually, you know what? I should zoom this down a little bit because if I do, I can zoom faster. But I want you to be able to read it still here. Okay. <gasps> Look at this. Did we put this up in class? You bet we did. Look at that. Although the one I put up in class was a little bit more graphical because I, I did it in PowerPoint to kind of animate it here. But look at that. We talked about acquisition cost. There's some base profit, profit from increased purchases. Oh, lifetime value. Look at that. Profit from reduced operating costs, profit from referrals, profit from price premium. Yeah. Okay. So this chart is valuable, but be sure you understand what each of these means and how they kind of act. Okay. So meaning sometimes we like to make things so efficient, especially supply chain students. What the heck's with the supply chain students? They always like focus on efficiency here. It's in our blood, it's in our DNA. Okay, so, but for everybody, sometimes it's like, okay, yeah, I'll just go through, look at the articles and look at all the figures there. That could be good, but what I say, do I understand what's meant by base profit? And what do they mean by operating costs? And that's what it talks about here in the paper a little bit more. So understand that. Okay, so that I think kind of answers our first question, some of the factors. 
What ways does customer retention impact profitability? Okay, I don't know. Does it impact profitability? The defection curve, the customer value, and how valuable customers are over time. Okay, so profitability. Hmm. Look at this. This is the value of the profit streams a customer generates in the average life. Wow. This is if we have the defection rate, if we can reduce it, okay, we can, the amount as we reduce it, each of these reduce it by, look at this, by 10%, by 10%, by 10%. What do we notice? The value is going up, but not in a linear way. It's going up even greater. Holy schmoly. Okay, can I say that? Holy schmoly, is that okay to say? I guess it's on the video here. We can edit it out. Beep, beep. Okay, I just said holy schmoly and the sensors just took me off of that. I'm not supposed to say holy schmoly on these things or something. I don't know. Uh, reducing defections can produce, produce profits by 25 to 85%. How can that be? The article discusses it. And we talked about it a lot in class. All right, what else do we have here? Uh, relationship between customer retention and lifetime value. Uh, that's kind of the same thing. I, can't, I think we've kind of seen the same concept there. As we retent, the value goes up, but not in a linear way necessarily. Uh, strategies for improving customer retention. Let's see what we have. Zero defections culture is a strategy. Um, let's see. There's a few others here that I've kind of passed by. Actually, you know what? I just realized. Well, I guess I'm only showing a piece of this. Do I have to get permission from Reichelt and Sasser to put their, their article on this video? Probably not. Uh, Reichel and Sasser, if you're still alive, let me know if you give me permission to post this video here. Okay. Um, there's things like, uh, hold on just a second, let me find here. Here's, here we go. Defection management. I love this section on defection management because it says, what can we do about this? Okay. So some of the things that talked about here, watching the door. Okay. What, what does that mean? Uh, what else did it talk about? What are the defectors telling you? Now, don't just read the italics words here, but I'm just doing that for the sake of time here. What are they telling you here? I mean, what do you learn from defectors? Uh, what else? Some more information about that. Uh, the culture thing. We didn't really talk about that in class. Well, we did. Remember the glasses thing where I talked about the glasses where you see customers for their lifetime value? That's really about the culture thing. The culture is making it be part of us as a company, as an organization, that we believe that defections really can hamper our profitability and that we can see that lifetime value. And what that does, the culture does, we talked about in class, is it motivates us to be more uh, attentive to customer needs and to retaining our customers. All right, any questions about the Reich Held and Sasser article? All right, let's talk about vendor malware and RADA. And by the way, it took me probably three years to figure out how to say vendor malware. And even now I can't say it right. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Just tap the space bar. Okay, so uh, servitization. And what, what, what are ways that companies move to servitization? And what drives it? And what way is a competitive tool? You know what? I'm sorry to have to say this. But these are basically the headings of that article here. And one thing I like about this article is, and so the version I'm showing you here is the one that I OCR so it can be readable here. So hopefully it's the one that you studied as well. You'll see the page breaks, the same content if you have the one that's not the OCR one. This is gonna be a lot easier to read here. Okay, so let's look at the headings here. On definitions, no definitions, I already refuted that. It talks about for purposes of this article. Oh, are you seeing what I highlight here, by the way? I just highlighted it. Since, okay. For the purpose of this article, we will take the view that service perform rather than uh, RA performance rather than produce and essentially intangible. Okay. I wish I could strike that out. Actually, you know what? I bet I could. Sure. Oh, no, I have to edit the PDF file. Anyway, I can't strike it out. Vander Merwer and Rada said that. So, But it's wrong. That one sentence is wrong. Okay. The move to servitization. So our question that we were looking at was, 
you know, and what ways do companies move to servitization? Okay, right there, move to servitization. And then it takes us through the little stages that we went through. We talked about that in class. I went through some examples of that. Okay, the next question was, lo and behold, what drives servitization? Okay, now I'm back in the article here. Customers are driving servitization. Okay, now still read this stuff and review what this talks about and what does this mean for the customers to drive it. But that's really true, is that companies can say, oh, should we servitize or not? It's like, well, it's servitize or die in some cases because customers may insist on it or the market may insist on it. So review that section. Uh, the next question talks about, bar okay, now here's the barriers. Uh, what drives servitization? In what way is servitization a competitive tool? And that's this discussion here about uh, as a competitive tool. Whoa, servitization is a competitive tool. And that's, you know, barriers to competition, third parties and so forth. So, okay. Uh, next question is, I bet we can guess the next question. In fact, you know what? I'll bet chat GPT, as dumb as it is in 2023. And I know you people in the future are making fun of us, but that's okay because we'll catch up with you sometime. Uh, let's see, the next question was, uh, how does conversation play in strategic positioning? So changing the competitive dynamics, actually that doesn't match the title, but it's the competitive dynamics, the dividing. Arm. So this is the idea that it's hard to tell, you know, there's a blurring here, dividing line between manufacturers and service companies is less clear. Wow, that's pretty profound to think about. Companies are competing with new rivals. They're competing with their customers by serving. They're competing with other divisions of their own companies and stuff like that, okay? Uh, they're finally thing, there's this thing about, okay, uh, the strategy basics, we talked about this already. What business are we in? What business can we be in? There was this question, which was, uh, let's see, what business do we wanna be in? That's that last part's pretty straightforward here. This thing, the back to basics section asks, when is, uh, more service too much. I briefly addressed that in class. Let's see, hold on just a second. Too much. Oh my goodness, there's two of those here. When is more services too much? On page nine. You know what just dawned on me? That's bad grammar. It should be when are more services too much? Okay. Two errors in this document. That's okay. Most documents have errors. Uh, when are more services too much? Or when, I don't know, maybe it could be is. I don't know. Anyway, uh, I asked that question because just to emphasize that more is not necessarily better. And in class, we talked about deservitization, which is getting out of services or less interaction, moving from direct interaction to surrogate interaction. So you can have too much service. That's possible. All right. I'm going to get more yawns here if I don't step this up a little bit here. So let's move along here. Uh, Dasso and Chase. Oh, actually, you people in the future, you're watching me at double speed. Just dawned on me. The people here live, you're watching me at single speed. So thank you for bearing with this. Okay, Dasso and Chase, what impact does emotions have on customer behavior and response? Actually, these other two I can close. Let me close this. Raquel? And Benjamin, okay. So the question is, what impact does emotions have on customer behavior and response? And we talked about this, especially things like designing for emotions. Look at this. Emotions influence what we remember, how we score encounters and the decisions we make. You know what? Almost every decision has an emotional element to it. Wow. Trust is a primary psychological variable that is essential to a robust and enduring relationship. Trust bonds us together, enduring. Control, how it's gonna be resolved, our fundamental psychological needs. We have a need for control, but you know what? You can't always get what you want, which is copyright. I just probably shouldn't have said that because now Mick Jagger's gonna come after me saying, hey, wait a second. If you try some time, you just may find you get what you need. And I'll say, I didn't say that. So I'm just saying you can't always get what you want. Okay, I hope this makes any sense at all to you young people. In the future, you're even younger. 
Some of you people in the future are not even born when I'm recording this here. And you're going to say, Samson, what are you talking about? All right. People already say that. Okay. So the ECTs. So that's, that really influences how customers respond here. Their behavior and response. An emotion print. Okay. Now, again, it's nice to read the headings, but you do need to know how to design for emotions. You do need to know how to, you know, there's a thing about tracking them. Oh, here's our emotion print. Here's how we track these things. Look at this. So it tells us, look at that positive, negative. It's kind of like a PCN diagram where we have the smileys and the frownies. But here it's just showing this kind of emotional journey here that people go through in these things. So know what an emotion print is. Uh, what does it tell us? Where is it applicable? It's, in, it's applicable in a lot of different businesses. If it's applicable wherever we have an emotional journey, which is pretty much every interaction we have, every business we have, we interact with, there's some emotional element. In class, I talked about pumping gas at Costco is an emotional experience. Uh, what are sources and functions of trust? Okay, lo and behold, let's move on beyond emotions. You know, it is just emotions that's taking me over, tied up in sorrow, lost in my soul. I'm not doing participation today. Does anybody know where that's from? It's just emotion that's taking me over. Okay, hold on just a second. Let's call this up here. This is going to be a little commercial break here. B, G's, emotion. Okay, oh, there it is. First on it found. Okay, here we go. Ready? I don't know if you'll hear this or not. Oh, please, no ads. Please, no ads. It's the Bee Gees. I'm sorry I can't share the screen. It's on my other screen. So, but the so Okay. There, just a second. There you go. Ready? There we go. In the words of a broken heart, it's just a Can you hear that at all? Is that coming through? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, a little bit. Uh, go look up uh, BG's emotion. Uh, Andy and Barry and uh, what's the other brother's name? Maurice or something. Anyway, okay. So back on track here. Sorry about that. It was a little commercial break there. Designing for trust. Okay. So they had a list of things. We kind of went through them in class, but kind of quickly. Professional experience, clear communication, uh, active involvement. So I went through these kind of briefly in class, gave a few examples. Smart follow up, likability, willingness to take the high road. So understand what they are. That's how we build trust is through that little list of things that are on. Covered on page number, what, uh, 37. All right. Sources and functions of trust, we already did that. What are two forms of control? Okay, let's scroll down here. Scroll down. Designing for control. And then they talk about here, it's in italics, behavioral control and cognitive control. So we talked about that in class. Those are the two forms of control. And then how do we do, how do we provide control and stuff like that? That's prim primarily how we do it. Okay, let's move on. Any questions about Dasso and Chase? All right. Let's see, was there anything after that? Uh, yeah, Richard Chase. He and I have written papers together. I love Richard Chase, Dick Chase. What a great guy. The guy is, in, in this year, I shouldn't say this, he's actually 83. And he and I are still working on a research project right now. Look at this case, okay, 83 years old. What a great example, hardworking guy. He just loves what he does. Okay, back on track. Fry, we'll get through this. Breaking the trade off. Okay, let me get rid of that one. What are the five types of customer variability? What are examples? We spent a ton of time in class on that. So breaking the trade off. Uh, this is a great article. Shout out to Francis Fry, good friend of mine. Five types of variability, here they are. Uh, recap. So I remember R E C A K. There's request, capability, effort. Although if you use them in order, the acronym to remember them is not recap. It, it is RARCAST. Huh. What is it? What is it? I'm missing one here. No, at no, it's R A R arrival request. R no recap is easier or racer for those of you that are kind of like sporty people here. Okay, so what are they? What are examples? Okay, now 
everybody in the video audience is saying, why is it YouTube only does double speed? Why doesn't it do quadruple speed? All right, where were we? Uh, four alternative strategies for managing. Oh, I love this article. It's such a brilliant article. Okay, this we did this in class to kind of show how the trade-offs work here. This little table here, we spent quite a bit of time in class talking about this. So these are the four strategies: classic accommodation, low-cost accommodation, class reduction, and compromise reduction. So what do they mean? And then how do we kind of do them? So particularly for low-cost accommodation, low-cost labor, automation, outsource, which is we talked about the least. That's the least of the, of the ones that are listed here. Creating self-serve options, which what's the difference between low-cost labor and self-serve? Self-serve is no cost. You let the customer do it themselves. What's the difference between automation and self-serve? They're kind of the same. Because usually how we self-serve is through automation. So that was something we emphasized in class. All right. Oh, uh, and then uh, over here, this was, should be kind of obvious. Uncompromised reductions. Okay. What was the clue there? Look at that. Target, 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 target. We're just like one away from a super target here, which by the way, they're building a new target down in the Provo Mall. Did you hear that? What the heck's with that? This is a mall. Targets don't go in malls. Targets go in shopping centers. Oh, this world we live in. Okay, so we target is how we do that. So review that. It's, we talked quite a bit of time in class about that. Uh, okay, we're making more progress here. Normative and instrumental means of motivating customers. So if we're going to do this, if we're going to do this uncompromised reduction, where is normative? Solutions in practice. Hold on. Let me just do a search here. Norm. Can you just do norm? Oh, actually, hold on just a second. Hold on. For those of you in the future who are making fun of us because we're using chat GTP. Okay, I probably shouldn't do this, but I'm going to anyway. Okay, I'm going to share a different window here. New share. Hold on. Uh, okay, can you see chat GTP? Can you see that? All right. Yes. Thank you. All right. So here's some of the questions I've asked before. Best Rome stay options, JavaScript enabled, because some good movies. It actually gives me good movie recommendations. A uh, duck definition. I asked it to tell me what a duck was. So we're going to go under that one here. Let's see what it has here. That's kind of a conversation I've had with chat GDP. Oops. It's not working. Oh, what's meant by a research gap? Okay. So what was the question we were just talking about? Oh, I forgot. Hold on just a second. It was, I'm going to try this. I've never tried this before, but I'm just doing this to, so that the people in the future won't make fun of us for using old technology here. So here we go. What's the difference between normative instrumental means of motivating customers? What do you think it's going to say? Well, we will find out. Okay, normative means motivating customers revert to appealing to a sense of morality or social responsibility in order to encourage certain behaviors. For example, a company may advertise their environmentally friendly products in order to appeal to customers' desire to help the planet. Instrumental means motivating customers refer to appealing to self-interest or practical benefits in order to encourage certain behaviors. For example, a company may offer a discount or other incentive for customers to sign up for their loyalty programs. In summary, the main difference between normative instrumental means and motivating customers is the type of appeal being made, moral, social responsibility versus self-interest or practical benefits. The uh, instrumental also is kind of carrot and stick, you know? You give, them a, you give them a discount or you give them a reward or you punish them, you give them a penalty or something like that. Is this a good answer to that question? What do you think? It is. So people in the future, stop making fun of us. And by the way, people in the present, stop making fun of people from the 70s. You know, we thought bell bottoms would take off. <laughs> they may come back. Okay. Corduroys, you know, these things will all come back. Disco. Okay. It's starting to come back, I think. All right. So, uh, and I know people in the future saying, why are you having this review? We just turned our exams to take an exam. We just turned it over to chat GDP 99. And it takes the exam for us. Now, you sing Wally, right? You know, Wally, where everybody's sitting around doing nothing for themselves. Oh, by the way, Wally was a movie back from like 1990 or something. But uh, you can see from Wally that uh, people 
they they got lazy and it almost destroyed their their big ship they were floating in there. So still take your exams. Okay, sorry. Let me go back to where I was. Okay, um, here we go. Okay, are you seeing that? Are you seeing the syllabus again? All right. Uh, any questions about the Fry article? All right, last but not least, people are thinking, wow, this has taken a long time. All right, we're almost done. Uh, Norman and Ramirez, my favorite article. Okay, uh, Francis' article is great. Chase and Dasso and Chase, they were great articles, but this is my favorite. What's the ultimate purpose of firms? Okay. Uh, actually, here, this is the one that I wish I had my marked up copy. There's actually tear marks on this on this particular article, my paper copy, from when I was crying, when I was reading it, and it's just in tears of joy. Okay, so what is the ultimate purpose of, of firms here? Okay, uh, there's a lot of things in here about that. I can't summarize any one. They're focused on strategic analysis. Oh, actually here, in so volatile a competitive environment, strategy is no longer a matter of positioning. So the, the positioning, the strategic positioning, the strategy is really about defining your firm. It's a fixed set of activities along the value chain. It's no longer that. Increasingly, successful companies do not just add value, they reinvent it. They, the focus of strategic analysis is not the company or even the industry, but the value creating system itself within which different economic actors, suppliers, business partners, allies, customers work together to co-produce together. And I'm not gonna go into the turtle song. You look that up on your own. It's the turtles happy together, okay? Their key strategic task is the reconfiguration of roles and relationships among the constellation of actors in order to mobilize the creation of value in new forms and by new players. Isn't that just beautiful? It's almost artistic here. And their underlying strategic goal is to create an ever-improving fit between companies and their customers. To put it another way, successful co uh, companies conceive a strategy as systematic social innovation, the continuous design and redesign of complex business systems. Okay, I go to the uh, cemetery sometimes because I have people that I know that are buried there. And they sometimes on their gravestones, they have like a picture of a motorcycle because they're a motorcycle rider or a one guy had a picture of a tractor. It's like, why is that? You know, is he like in tractor poles? Okay, so in case I come up with something else, this is what I want on my tombstone here is this little paragraph here. It's probably too much. You probably have to pay by the word. So we'll have to summarize. Now, okay, I'll probably come up with something else. But this is truly poetic here. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll go faster now. We can edit out all this commentary before we post this on YouTube. Uh, true source of competitive advantage. We've kind of talked about that a little bit. Well, actually, I'm going to show you this. Uh, there's in page 74, true source. So to get there faster, I'll search for it. Okay. This is on page. So it's on page 74. Let's see. Where's page numbers? Oh, 69. Okay. Uh, true source. Okay, there was these three imperatives here. Be sure you study these things. Okay, one is value. We already talked about this one. Value occurs not in a sequence of change, but in complex constellations. We mobilize, create value for themselves. We already talked about that one. For second, for true offerings, it's also true for systems as they become more complex. Rarely. Uh, so do the relationships produce them? A single company rarely provides everything anymore. It's a constellation. Third, if the key to creating value is to co-produce offerings that mobilize customers, then the only true source of competitive advantage is the ability to conceive of the entire value creating system and make it work. And in class, what do we call that? To conceive of the entire value creating system and make it work. Anybody remember? It's called the prime mover. Okay, so that is not in the article. So the prime mover, uh, in the article, he called it the meta competence. Okay, 
they, they, a virtual meta competence, meaning a competence that is about organizing other competences or uh, competencies, I guess you could say, is that they organize other competencies, that we identify competencies from different resources and we organize them into a package that has what? It has a lot of. We organize these competences, the competencies together into a bundle. What do we call that? Density. Okay, talked about that in class. So, density, which was only mentioned twice in the article, but that's okay. But uh, it's enough that we need here. What is density? Okay, so review that. Be sure you know what density is. How do firms mobilize the creation of value? That is what the article is about. So I don't have anything particular. We already talked about a couple of references about that, but the article is really about how do we mobilize customers? Uh, in particular, you remember there is, the article talked about the innovations. This was chapter five, so you get this from chapter five as well. They were called enabling and relieving, okay? Which is interesting, was only mentioned once in the article here. Okay, enabling customers. So IKEA's goal is not to relieve customers from doing certain tasks, but to mobilize them to do certain things they've never done before. In another way, they reinvent value by enabling customers. So in chapter five, we call that enabling and relieving innovation. So you need to know what that is and be able to give an example of what that means. Okay, uh, value chain and constellation. We already talked about that. The chain is kind of linear where you position yourself somewhere in that. The constellation is more the network where we take all these different competences, competencies and we integrate them together. All right, well, that, my friends, is all of the articles. Any questions so far? Okay, again, people in the future, email me about this. Uh, the last thing I'm gonna do is, if there's no questions, is I'm gonna show you the first page of the exam. Now, I wish you said, you're saying, why don't you show us the whole exam? Now, we'll just do the first page now, why? So in the exam, and by the way, I'm not sure if I'm gonna be there during the exam. I probably will, but, oops, the cord. Can you see outside? Can you see that? What's out there? No. A little bit or a lot of snow? A lot. There's Perfect for skiing. Yeah, it's beautiful. All right. So on Tuesday, okay, if I'm not there, the exam, where am I going to be? Uh, Samantha, or the TA will be there, whichever TA you have, because this is in the future. There's different TAs. But the TA will be there, at least, with the exam. In case I'm not here, if this snow continues, I'm probably not going to be here on Tuesday, try as I may. But I'll be with you in spirit. And you know from the first page of the syllabus, you have my cell phone number right there. Oops, I should bleep that out because in the future, I don't want people calling me. I don't want random YouTube people, so I'll figure out how to edit that out. But uh, I don't want random people calling me saying, hey, Samson, I liked your video. So we'll delete that before we post it, if we can. Uh, so if I'm not there on Tuesday, see, what well, the reason I like to be there is to provide moral support. You know, it's like, yeah, you can do this. Uh, but, you know, the TAs can do that as well. Uh, and I guess the TAs could go skiing for me. No, that wouldn't work. I need to go for myself. It's one of those things that you have to do yourself. So what will happen is students will have questions on the exam. And I've been doing this for how many years now? 2023, 20, 30 years now I've been doing this. The vast majority of the questions on the exam have the same answer. Okay, doesn't vary. What is that same answer? It is, did you read the instructions? Because like easily 80% or more of the questions students have about the exam are all covered in the instructions. So that's why in this little video, I am going to show you the instructions here 
so that you, if you forget to read them, because you're not going to read them, and some of you will read them. And actually, the people that will read them are the same people who read the terms and conditions every time they install some software. And they click, you've read this. Or just this morning, I had to check in for a flight. And uh, it said, did you read all this stuff about all the different things you're not supposed to take on a plane? And I said, yes, because at some point I probably read it in the past. You know, it's all kind of the same. But they probably put something else in there. It's like, you're not supposed to bring glasses on a flight anymore. Ha! I'll get to the airport. They'll say, you said, you checked that you read this. Okay. Well, okay, so here we go. So this is winter 2023. It covers the articles, the chapters, and class discussions. Okay. Uh, Professor Sampson, that's me. Uh, instructions for each question provide the best possible answer, not some lame answer. All right, so how do you know if it's the best? Well, if you have a choice, so multiple choice, for example, if you look at the answers and you say, ah, oh, this one seems like it could be right, this one could be right, pick the best one, because there's always the best one. And sometimes the other answers that are wrong are distracting, they seem right when really they're not. So don't deceive yourself. I mean, the best way to take a multiple choice uh, uh, part of the exam, and I've already told you what the breakdown of the exam is on that fact document. So review that if you want to know how many questions of what types. But for multiple choice, uh, what you do is you read the question and then think about the answer and write it on the exam, which um, today we're doing exams that are you write on the exams for this uh, for this exam. And then you then find the answer that most class matches what you had there. So you should write on the exam. Be sure and put your first name, your name, first and last name on the first page and on 10 and 11. That helps us later when we uh, grade this thing. Uh, unless because we split it up and we have it's, it's divisional labor here to grade it. Unless improved by the instruction in advance, exam time is limited to class time, an hour and 10 minutes. I already told you in the fact, I've been doing this for a lot of years now. The first exam will come in in 30 minutes. Trust me on that. And everybody else in class, I mean, what? How did they get done? Crank through it. Almost everybody will be done in about an hour. Uh, after an hour and 10 minutes, there will be a couple students who will say, are you done? And, you know, oh, are you done? And usually it's like, oh, I'm done. But I'm, they're agonizing over the last question. And then what happens is they, I say, well, I got to go now or whatever, you know, and, you know, whatever reason. If I haven't approved beforehand that they get, should get extra time, which some students get that approval beforehand. And uh, as they're walking up, they're sitting there with a pencil and they're, I see they're erasing and they're writing something or they're scribbling with a pencil or a pen. And then they'll turn in their exam and then they will say to me, they'll say, hey, Professor Sampson, now that I've turned in my exam, can I ask you about one of the questions? And I'll say, sure, as long as you promise you won't talk to anybody else about this. They'll say, what was the answer to number 2017 or whatever, you know, whatever question is. What was the answer to that number? And I'll look on the exam and I'll say, oh, well, the answer to that was J or M or whatever. I don't know what the answer was. I'm making this up here. And then they'll say, what will they say? They'll say, oh, that's what I had. And I just changed it. Can I change it back? And the answer is no. Turn it in. Okay. Don't second guess yourself. Because I rarely, you'd be amazed how many times I've had that conversation, is that you change it from a right answer to a wrong answer. Okay, so just answer the questions and then don't say, some people think, oh, if I just think about it long enough, you know, and I'll pray. You know what? If you don't know the answer, it's very unlikely the Lord's going to give you the answer in the exam itself, you know? You should be praying when you're studying. In the exam, just pray, help me to remember the things that I've studied here, and that's good. But don't pray for revelation about this. And you can't use chat GDP in 2023. You can't use chat GDP on your exam. So uh, no phones or any devices in the exam, except for a pen or paper. Uh, okay. Every answer should be just based on an article of the book, including class presentations, discussions, not some other source. Thus consider that each question begins with according to the reading. And the reason I say that is on some rare occasions, a student will say to me, I, I had this class a couple of years ago where they had a different answer to this question. It's like, well, I'm sorry. I wasn't in that class with you. I didn't know there was another answer to this. We're doing the answer based on what we covered in class and was in the reading. So assume that everything is from the reading. 
Scores will be scaled to match the portion of the course grade for the exam. When I show you the points, it totals to 200 points, actually more than 200. It's like, wow, to get 100 points for this, you only have to do half of it. No, I scale it for that. In fact, what there is some kind of bonus built into it because it doesn't come to exactly 200. It's a little bit more than that. So, But anyway, I'll kind of scale it so that it works out this out of 100 points. And again, trust me, people are going to ace this exam because every, every year we have some people that wind up acing it after I get done scaling it and some people that... I don't do as well, but we can work on that. So don't, you know, don't stress more than necessary. Stress enough that you study. Uh, it is likely that our students have not yet taken the exam. I do allow some students to take the exam early because they're at a Rubik's Cube competition or something. On rare occasions, I let them take it late, but that's not, that's very rare occasions. And by the way, if you're planning to take it late, if you haven't talked to me already, too late. I mean, I guess you can still talk to me, but uh you know, we're probably going to do it early. But still, that, uh, regardless, if someone asks how the exam was, your answer should simply be, it was. Do not say, oh, it was hard. Or don't say, oh, it was easy. I mean, that would be a mean thing to say is, oh, it was trivial. I shouldn't have even studied. And then the person says, oh, then I won't study. And then they bomb the exam. But then they come back and you say, you said it was easy. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you meant to get a low score was easy. That's what I meant. It's easy to get a low score, you know, especially on multiple choice. Just pick some random letters, you know. Multiple choice or is four points each, which is not technically true because I scale it down. Write your final answer in the left margin and circle it. So for these written exams, in some cases, I use bubble sheets. So if I do the bubble sheets, you bubble it on the bubble sheet. This exam, we're not going to do bubble sheets. We're just going to write it on the exam and you circle your final answer. The reason is, is sometimes you will uh, change your mind and I'll see things where people have like put down like four different answers or something like that. And I can't tell which one was their final answer. So when you get kind of done with everything, write down what your final answer is for the multiple choice questions and circle it. And then we know that's the final answer. If you circle more than one, trouble. And I know sometimes people think, well, hey, it's either like A or C. So I'll put down both, and surely Professor Samps is smart enough to figure out which one is right. Well, you know what? You're not going to get any points for that because it's you that's supposed to come up with the answers, not me or the TAs. Okay, short answer questions. Most I give you a box for them. I don't have a copy. Oh, yeah, I do have a copy of the exam here. All right. Oh, man. I don't want you to see the answers here, but um, I promise if I put it on video, people are going to zoom in to try to see what it says there. But basically, there's a little box under the thing that you need to write in the box. And I know some you're thinking, well, hey, I'm the creative type. I like to work outside of the box. Don't do it, okay? So uh, the legible answers, and it needs to be legible, which almost everybody's legible, but some of you know you are not legible. So do your best. Uh, so one or two sentences. Actually, sometimes you even need less than a sentence. You know, you can answer in five words or something. But just, just give us what we need. You can write more than that if necessary, but your answer must fit inside the box. Now, for short answers, one problem is sometimes what students do is they think, oh, it's either this or this. So I'll kind of write both in there. And these things are out of four points each on the full scale here is uh, four points each. So it's like, well, if you put in a right answer and a wrong answer, the most you're getting is 50% on that one, meaning two out of the four points. Even if one of them is spot on and the other one is completely wrong. You know, the one spot on, it's like, you're going to lose points. So don't do the shotgun approach. Do the targeted approach, which is just say, what's the answer? And just give an answer that works. It's not our just have to go through. So I kind of say here, four points is the best answer. And we get a lot of those. Uh, three points for a good answer, but it's like eh, a little bit of a stretch. Actually, that's kind of two points. The stretch is kind of ones that are like, eh, I guess if I'm creative, I could see how that would work. One point for a right answer on a different question on this topic, meaning... You know, that's, it's wrong, but it's, it's actually a right answer about something else. And you need to be precise. And then zero points for wrong or no answers. Uh, short as essay answers must be precise. Correct answers, legal thing, correct answers to produce average scores at best. Um, so that kind of is redundant there. Uh, lastly, questions about questions. If you think one of the questions is unclear, Write the question number here, explaining what is unclear. I will look at it. I do this pretty much every semester. I've been doing it for a long time now. Some of the questions we have this time are newly revisions or old questions or whatever. Some of them are the same, meaning I have a big 
I have a big bank of questions and some of them, uh, but I, I'm very careful. Like when I write a new question, I scrutinize that thing very carefully. And even old questions, if there's something somebody says, well, hey, we don't know what this means, something like that. I revise them, meaning I put a lot of work into my uh, question bank to make sure it's good. But if you have any you have concerns with, I will go through these and give people the benefit of the doubt on this in the sense of meaning if my question was actually wrong, I will make sure that we have some accommodation for that. All right, that's the first page of the exam. So and it, uh, in the future, as a disclaimer, it could change a little bit, meaning, you know, I might have a statement in there about you can't use chat GDP 27 on this or whatever. So this is not exact. This is from 2023. So for those of you in the future, uh, I hope you're enjoying the future here. I hope it's, you know, wonderful and stuff like that. You're still learning. I hope it's not like Wally -E where you're all sitting around you know, sitting on chairs and not having to actually get up and walk anywhere and stuff like that. If you're still exercising and eating fruits and vegetables and all those kind of things like that. So, all right, uh, students that are live here, is there anything I can do for you? All right, let me know. Okay, uh, you have my cell phone. And by the way, the ski resort often has cell phone reception. So, you know, in case I'm not here, even at the exam, you have my cell phone number. You know, if you're stuck, ask the TA first. And if the TA says, well, did you read the instructions? And then otherwise, you know, you can call me if I'm not here. So, all right. I love you guys. Uh, I will pray in your studying that you'll be able to have enlightened minds. And we will see you in class next week when we actually have the exam. Please be on time. Uh, if you get there early, we set the tables up in rows. They're not in table circles where you're facing people. Everybody's facing forward. So uh, even in the future, we're going to do this if we still have classrooms. So we got all the tables facing forward. So if you show up early for class, arrange the seats so they're all facing forward. And then everybody pick your thing. And also, by the way, this is kind of university policy. I, I don't know university. It's my policy. I got this from somebody else. I don't think it's university policy. It's, if you wear a baseball hat in the exam, you wear it backwards. I don't know where I got that from, but somebody told me that years ago. It's kind of weird. Some people don't, you know, shower, or comb their hair on exam days. So they wear a hat. So if you wear a hat, you just wear it backwards. Although some people are going to come in with like a big sombrero or something. It's like, you can't wear those backwards because they're kind of symmetrical there. But anyway, all right. Uh, but just come in prepared and it will be glorious. All right. We're signing off. Let's see. How do I turn off the uh, recording here? Oh, here we go. Stop recording.